Harold W. Samuelson lecture focuses on public health practice. Past lectures have been on the politics of lead poisoning, the decline of public health infrastructure, and impacts of public health studies on the general population, to name a few. I want to acknowledge and express my appreciation to Dr. Paul Samuelson, who has uh, graced us with his presence as he's done each year. So thank you, Paul, for being here. This lectureship honors Carol for her outstanding service through years of devoted commitment to the Jefferson County Department of Health, as well as many other community and statewide organizations interested in providing quality health care. In all her professional and community activities, Carol led with diligence and innovation while always placing the public first. This lectureship was created to honor her passion for excellence as well as to continue her tradition of intellectual innovation and community involvement. Although I am relatively new in my position as Dean, I have the honor and pleasure of knowing Carol many years before coming back to UAB. She was that rare community leader whose heart and soul were bound to their life's work to guarantee that for others, life will be filled with possibilities and opportunities. Her untimely death several years ago saddens all of us who knew Carol and so often followed her lead toward efforts to improve the health and well-being of everyone in our community, most especially the disenfranchised and marginalized. The legacy of her work in many areas in public health and this endowed lecture give life and voice to her vision and hopes for better places for people to live, work, and play. Providing the Carol W. Samuelson lecture today is Alan Will. Alan Will is the editor-in-chief of Health Affairs, the nation's leading health policy journal. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, an appointed member of, Medicaid, of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, and a trustee of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, D.C. He was the executive director of the National Academy for State Health Policy and directed the Urban Institute's Assessing the New Federalism Project. He has held a cabinet position as executive director of the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, which is that state's Medicaid agency. He was the assistant general counsel in the Massachusetts Department of Medical Security. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California at Berkeley, a master's degree from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a JD from Harvard Law School. Alan Will, welcome to the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Thank you for being here. It's a great honor to have been asked to give the 16th annual uh, Carol Samuelson lecture. And as I was uh, speaking to Dr. Michael about what I might talk about, he did point out that there's an election coming up and uh, that people might be interested in the implications of that election for uh, health and health policy going forward. I decided that prognosticating about an event and thinking about what could be or might be was a little narrower than this event warrants. And so I'm going to try to go a little deeper into where we are as a country and thus my title, uh, The End of U.S. Health Policy, which was primarily designed to draw you here to wonder what in the world I was going to say. Um, I do have to say I, I never met uh, Carol Samuelson, but I read about some of her work. And also in thinking about my talk, you know, she worked to establish school-based clinics to reduce infant mortality, focused, as you know, on public health. At a time when these were uh, innovative ideas, but also over time became uncontroversial. This is what we need to do to promote health. And I started thinking about where we are politically as a country today, and I thought about those kinds of efforts, and I hope to weave that into my uh, comments as well. And uh, having just barely met the other Dr. Samuelson uh, last night at dinner, I, I hope uh, you feel that I do justice to her memory. Um, so I'm going to present a hypothesis, uh, the implications of that hypothesis and where it leads us. Uh, I do want to say at the outset, I can tell they're working on the sound. Um, this is a bit of an exploratory talk. Hopefully a lecture like this is designed not to just say things that we've all thought of already. So even the implications of my own thinking are not entirely clear. Um, and uh, 
I also, when I took communications training, everyone has to take communications training, the first thing they say is, whenever you give a talk, you have to, what, you have to think, what are your goals? What do you want people to do as a result of what you have to say? Well, I want you to think, and I hope it draws you to act. I'm not exactly sure what I want you to think or what action I want you to take, but uh, if it does those two things, um, I think I will have succeeded. And just one last preliminary comment. Um, I'm an optimist. Why do I say this at the outset? I give a lot of talks. And about two-thirds of the way through most of them, people just are depressed. <laughs> and then I will say, but I'm an optimist. And they're like, I don't believe you. You don't sound like an optimist. So I'm going to say it in advance. I am an optimist. I don't exactly know the road from here to where I hope we will be. But I believe we will create it. And the fact that I don't have the answers doesn't mean I'm pessimistic about figuring out the answers. So enough with the preliminaries. Let me start with my hypothesis. The hypothesis is the title of the talk. We've reached the end of health policy in the United States. Now, obviously, we're, we have and will continue to have health policy. So let me be a little more precise. What I mean is there does not now exist a core set of agreed upon values that underlie health policy in the United States. That's really my hypothesis. We don't have a foundation of core values on which to build a health policy in the United States. And let me just present you with some evidence. One of the things I struggle with in a talk like this is I'd much rather talk about the hypothesis and the evidence for it than the implications. But I think if I spend all of my time doing that, I leave you with not enough to work with. So if you go to the website of, for example, the British National Health Service, you'll find that the principles and values that guide the NHS, uh, which was launched in 1948, it was based on three core principles, that it meet the needs of everyone, that it be free at the point of delivery, and that it be based on clinical need, not ability to pay. And these three principles have guided the development of the NHS for the past 70 years and remain at its core. Now, that's the Brits. You know, they celebrate the NHS at the Olympics. Um, you're supposed to laugh at that. Hopefully you saw the scene there. You know, they're, they're, they own the health system in the UK. And so that, that, maybe that's just them. Maybe that's just the British. After We fought a war to, of independence against them. We can't really draw all of our inspiration from them. You all are going to have to lighten up a little. You, 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 you are not going to enjoy the next. And I am not going to enjoy the next 40 minutes if you don't laugh at any of my jokes. Um, so let's go elsewhere. Um, I, uh, I, I don't uh, read French, but the Commonwealth Fund does great profiles of different country systems. If you look at, the, at France, you see the first statement in their description, the provision of health care in France is a national responsibility. Planning and regulation within health care involves negotiations among provider representatives, the state, and the statutory health insurance funds. The outcomes of these negotiations are translated into laws passed by parliament. So this is not the UK. This is not a state-owned system. But you know the French equality, liberty, fraternity. You know, Again, maybe we just shouldn't be listening to them. They're not like us. So I went to Japan. I also do not speak Japanese. But thankfully, the Commonwealth Fund also has an excellent summary of their system where they begin by saying the government regulates nearly all aspects of the universal statutory health insurance system. The national and lo local governments are required by law to ensure a system that efficiently provides good quality medical care. Don't fall out of your seats. The national government sets the fee schedule and gives subsidies to local governments, insurers, and providers. This goes on and on. These are just a few nations, our peers around the world. If you go to the website of CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which runs the major programs in the United States, and you go to the page that says Mission, Vision, and Goals, this is what you will see. CMS's mission is to serve Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. That's the mission. Uh, <laughs> they, did, uh, they did get the, the memo from the consultants that short mission statements are good. <laughs> The CMS vision is to become the most energized, efficient, customer-friendly agency in the government, a high bar. Uh, <laughs> at least you laughed at that one, thank you. Uh, CMS will strengthen the healthcare services and information available to Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries and the healthcare providers who serve them. That's the vision. Now, to be fair, I'm always fair, 
If you go to the HHS website, the parent agency over CMS, you will hear that improving the health of all Americans is the HHS goal. But HHS does a lot of things that aren't health care. CMS is where the, 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 the home of, of health care finance is in the United States. And the mission is to serve their beneficiaries. I see these as very different conceptions of what it means to have a health care system, what the role of government is. Now, programmatically, when I say there are no values that join us, uh, you might say, well, Medicare is extremely popular. Politicians uh, of both, on both sides of the aisle will claim that the other side is trying to destroy Medicare. That's sure to get you political points. It's not that we don't have things and programs that we agree upon. You could say, similarly, that there's strong bipartisan support for the Veterans Administration system. It's not that there aren't things that we support as a country. But the sense of core values, I don't see it. Now, maybe it's unfair to base it on what's on a website. But what's missing? I don't think you would disagree with me that the most obvious thing that's missing, and we all know this, is a commitment to universality. We do not have a shared value of access to universal health insurance. And that runs through all the other countries. But as important as that is, I would never understate it. There are other things that are missing. The principle of equity, the value of equity, which runs again through all of these other country systems. You may have different conceptions of what equity is. Equity is a, is a loose concept. It, it manifests itself in different ways. That, that value do, doesn't even show up in how we talk about the healthcare system. And I uh, recently had a paper with some colleagues where we talked about another thing which is stewardship. In other countries, the role of the government is to steward the entire healthcare system so that people get the care they need, even if they don't run the healthcare system. But for us, CMS, its mission is Medicare and Medicaid, even though the decisions they make have implications across the entire healthcare system. You don't see the concept of stewardship, which is uh, something the World Health Organization has talked about. You don't see it even mentioned in the US. So my hypothesis, just to get us started, is that in the United States, there's, there's no set of agreed upon values that underlie our health policy. Um, so what are the implications? That's when it gets more interesting. And the implications, again, I could spend more time than we have because I want to leave some time to what do we do about it. But I'll group them into three types of implications. The first implication is that we entertain and oscillate among wildly uh, divergent uh, policy options. We, we don't, if you don't have a core, think about it. When you, when, you, when you raise your kids, why is it important that they have a value structure? Because it bounds their behavior. Do you really want to do that? Is that consistent with your goal of getting into the best school? Is that something you want to feel good about when you uh, meet with your friends? Value systems constrain action. If we don't have a core set of values, everything's on the table. And I'm just going to give you two examples. Again, there are so many. But I want to try to illustrate the point. The debate we're having right now over uh, work requirements uh, for Medicaid. Now, for those of you who are steeped in this, you're nodding your head. For those of you who aren't, just to understand that Medicaid is a program that serves low-income Americans. In, it's run by the states, uh, jointly fu funded between the federal government and the states. And an increasing number of states are saying, if you're an adult and you are so-called able-bodied, then in order to receive the Medicaid benefit, you need to either be working or show that you're engaged in some sort of work activity or other community activity. The, the, the hypothesis being tested by this is that by requiring people to work, that those who need some additional motivation to engage in, their, in, in, in improving themselves uh, will have that motivation, because if they don't work, they lose their coverage. And that that motivation will, will lead to, to better, uh, uh, not just work engagement, but people who work tend to have better health, although the problem there is the causation goes both ways, but you can ignore that for now. The, the point is that the, the hypothesis is that this will motivate people to, to, to be where they should be in their lives, which is working. Now, I'm not here to debate the merits or demerits. Happy to after, but not, that's not my point. The point is that in most countries, 
you couldn't even imagine this because you begin with a premise of universality. You don't, we don't talk about, oh, we're going to take away your kid's education if you're not working because we start from a principle of universality. We don't say you're not going to get police protection or you won't be covered by the defense investment in this country if you don't follow certain rules. We, we begin with conceptions of universality. In other countries, you, you couldn't even, you couldn't even uh, have people look you in the eye after you said, we're going, to, we're going to try something. We want to get people more engaged in their health, and we're going to take away something that we all take as a given that everyone should have. So the bounds of, of debatable policy are, are, are much uh, wider when you don't have that core set of values. I'll give you another example. Um, we're in the middle of uh, multilateral skirmishes over the sale of so-called short-term health insurance plans. So under the Affordable Care Act, all of our insurance that you, uh, that, that you have, whether it's through your employer, through the health insurance exchanges, it follows certain rules. There are no limits on pre-existing conditions. There are certain services that it needs to cover. The rate, the, the premium that you pay can't be based on your health status. This is all part of what's in the ACA. But there has always been a provision for the sale of short-term plans, because people are sometimes between circumstances. And the Trump administration has expanded the parameters of what can be sold as a short-term plan. Those plans don't cover the same benefits. They don't cover mental health. They don't cover, none of them cover uh, uh, pregnancy. Um, they can have uh, pre-existing condition exclusions. And they can be, uh, most importantly, they can be underwritten, meaning they're only available to you if you meet certain health screens. Now, I, again, I'm not here to argue the merits or demerits of short-term health plans. What I'm here to say is that the debate over whether they should exist or under what, or what parameters should be in place when they exist is a reflection of the lack of agreement on principles of equity, on principles of solidarity, on principles of universal benefits. It's not that these are right or wrong, it's that we haven't agreed that everyone should have access to a consistent set of benefits. If we had agreed on that, these plans wouldn't exist. If we didn't agree on that, these plans would be fine. So what we're doing is we're playing out these value debates around every policy. Every policy comes along, and we think it's a debate about policy, but it, what it really is is a debate about underlying values. And because we don't have this consensus or agreement or a core sense of what our values are, pretty much any policy is up for debate because it's a proxy for the value discussion that we have never settled. So the first implication is highly unpredictable health policy. Now, I won't go too deep into the implications of that, though I was just meeting with some students who were, and the, one of the first questions they asked was about how the variability in health policy affects the ability of the healthcare system to plan for the future. It's really hard to plan the future for when you don't know what, what is on the table and what's off the table. And part of what we're seeing in the uh, volatility of health insurance premiums under the Affordable Care Act is that we don't know which of these things are likely to come. But that's the first implication, is this oscillation. The second implication, I think, is a little more pernicious. In the absence of core values, healthcare becomes just like anything else, any other consumer good. And that means that uh, profit maximization is the norm and acceptable, and it means that rent-seeking behavior, the ability to use uh, the rules of the road to create a, a segment, segment of the market where you can thrive and others can't. These are, we do this, it, it, this happens in all parts of the economy. If you don't have any value core, then these are the kinds of things you do. Now the evidence here is so easy to find, um, I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, in the Financial Times, a story just about a month ago, it made it into some other papers as well, with respect to a generic antibiotic for which the head of the company had uh, uh, Nermal Mulia, the chief executive of Nostrum, he increased the price by 400% for a generic drug and says, I think it is a moral requirement to make money when you can, to sell the product for the highest price. Now you're laughing, but he wasn't laughing. He didn't mean it as a joke. He meant it truly as, if I'm running a business, I'm the CEO of a business, I have an opportunity to increase my revenue, I have shareholders who expect me to do so, I'm going to do so. That's my moral obligation. It's certainly my legal obligation as a fiduciary to my shareholders. Here's a story from the Boston Globe. 
It's about uh, the McLean um, Psychiatric Hospitals, which is uh, one of the best in the, in the country, in the world. It's a story out of Camden, Maine. It says, in elegant rooms with sparkling views of Penobscot Bay, some of Harvard's most skilled psychiatrists treat patients from across the United States. Football players referred by the NFL, lawyers sent by their firms, a school janitor with a wealthy brother. What they have in common is the means to pay $2,150 a day for a minimum of 30 days of treatment at Borden Cottage, a remote output, uh, outpost of McLean Hospital, perhaps the country's best known psychiatric facility. Credit cards are welcome. Health insurance is not. So you're saying the core value uh, for health policy is debit or credit? Debit or credit. That's your choice. Now, again, I'm not here to criticize the hospital for the decisions they're making. What I'm here to say is that in the absence of a source of constraint, there is no reason for an actor in the system, unless it's in their own core values, to behave according to a set of social norms. And as a sixth of the economy, there's a lot of pressure to act as any other economic actor would do and is expected to do, which is growth and profit maximization. Um, we see this in provider consolidation, which is rampant around the country. We've published a lot of this in, in health affairs. On the one hand, consolidation is an opportunity for integration, for better communication, for team-based care. If you ask people who are bringing together hospitals and aligning hospitals and doctors and post-acute and all of those things, they will tell you it is all about better care for patients. But the evidence shows it's also about better negotiating leverage against payers. And there's no limit. A, a story recently in the Wall Street Journal about how hospitals were putting in their contracts that if we're going to be part of your insurance network, you can't exclude us from any of your insurance networks. And um, although we would like to think that antitrust law prevents the most egregious of this behavior. Um, I can say again, we've published quite a few papers showing how most of what's going on in healthcare around consolidation falls way below the thresholds that anyone who's enforcing the antitrust laws would even look at. And so this behavior, which again has a positive component to it, also has a component of being beneficial from an economic perspective. And just to be clear, this is not just financial action, this is political action as well. Um, there's a program you may or may not know of called the 340B program. It provides discounted prescription drugs. It was designed to give those inexpensive drugs to safety net providers who could then take the savings that they got from selling at lower prices and use them to provide more services to the indigent. Well, there are lots of ways to game the 340B program. And it turns out that there's lots of rent seeking, as in using the rules of the road uh, to, to, capture, to be able to buy the drugs at low price and, charge, and then uh, sell them or, or, or deliver them to people with commercial health insurance who are paying full freight and make a lot of money in the, same, in, in, in the transaction. Uh, the Medicare Advantage program, about a third of Americans who are on Medicare get their coverage through a private plan. That plan, uh, there's been years of documentation of how those plans use various rating rules to maximize their revenue. What's the consistent theme here? When the problem is found, there's resistance to changing policy because it would go against your do the dollars that you've built into your budgets. So the second implication of the lack of the core is that we tell people behave like rational economic actors and lo and behold, that's exactly what they do. They do it in the political sphere, they do it in the economic sphere. And the final implication is I think the, uh, not that the first two aren't pernicious enough, but I think the third one is the one that I've been contemplating the most, which is that it eliminates our ability to make rational resource allocations. The whole concept of stewardship goes away. When we talk about using any sort of formal comparative effectiveness methods to say we should pay for this drug, we shouldn't, what's the word used? Rationing. It's rationing. We don't do rationing. Every other country, if stewardship is part of what you're doing, and in every other domain of your life, people often like to use, you know, would your family do this? The federal government runs a huge deficit. Could you run a huge deficit? Think about your family. You have limited resources. 
you come up with decision rules for how to allocate those resources. You give up something because you can't have everything. There's no right way to allocate those resources, but at least implicitly and sometimes explicitly, you're thinking, this is where the dollars should go. These are the first order needs, these are the secondary needs. If there are no limits, if there's no sense that we have this much to serve this many people, then there's no reason to set those limits. What happens? We have policy that emerges from episodic outrage, from truly outrageous behaviors. Think about uh, what's happening around the prescription drug uh, debate. Prescription drugs, top issue if you ask the public, what are you concerned about in pricing? But where does that focus? It focuses on things like co-payments, focuses on the pricing for generic drugs. No question, these are pocketbook issues for, for people. But cancer drug prices upon release are $100,000 for a treatment. We have a whole new series of, of, of uh, immunotherapies that are in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, we have a cure for hepatitis C that we can't afford, although the price has come way down from its uh, launch of about $100,000 for treatment. What do these have in common? They're so expensive that no one is expected to pay for them out of pocket. And so there's no obvious point of interaction as a consumer with those prices. So where do we do, go? The political focus is on my $10 copay or the increase in price for insulin, which is outrageous. I don't mean to minimize those. But we have a ticking time bomb of increasingly expensive, um, in some instances, tremendous uh, clinical progress, in some instances more like copycats, and we don't focus there because the individual patient doesn't see it. Or think about the controversy right now over an attention being paid to surprise bills. You go to a hospital, it's in network, oh, turns out uh, the anesthesiologist wasn't in net network, or there was a surgical assistant who came in who wasn't in your network, and all of a sudden you have tens of thousands of dollars of bills, it's all over the New York Times. It's outrageous. It is outrageous. But the base charges, go look at the bill. It's not just the out-of-network costs that are high. In-network, they're high enough. We, we, uh, you know, we spend uh, well in excess of a trillion dollars on hospital care in this country. We don't look at those kinds of issues. We don't look at variation, geographic variation, even though we know it exists. We don't pay attention to consolidation, even though it raises prices. We focus on where the individual transaction is. My point is not to say that we shouldn't be worried about these things. It's to say that in the absence of overarching values that can guide decision making, policy focuses opportunistically where people get angry, and people get angry where they see it, but there's a huge amount that happens that's invisible. We focus on Medicaid, budget buster at the state level. We focus on Medicare. The trust fund is out of control. But we spend hundreds of, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars subsidizing employer-sponsored insurance. It doesn't show up on anyone's tax bill, so no one sees it. And when we start talking about capping how much you can deduct, um, everyone goes nuts and says you couldn't possibly constrain our health insurance, uh, how, the, the, what's covered under our health insurance. And I, I do have to note that the political anger and the political uh, responsiveness, it's tied to middle class issues. So the fact that we're not treating prisoners who have hepatitis C who could be cured, well, that's not a front page issue. But when the, the teacher gets a surprise bill, it's on the front page. And then the hospital backs down from the bill because the teacher, we want to take care of. Prisoner, maybe not so much. So let's not pretend that the growth of, of, of uh, patient-driven and consumer-driven uh, 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 policy here uh, it, it treats everyone equally. Now, I do want to say that for many people, the fact that we don't use these rational resource allocation methods is a, a testament to America's strength. We are rooted in the individual. Everyone is valuable. Every life is valuable. We should pay 
$800,000 to save this person's life. If it were my child, I would pay. That is very much rooted in American values. I'm not suggesting that there is not a value in having that value as well. But relying on that value and ignoring the many hundreds and in instances thousands of people whose lives could be improved or potentially saved by that same investment if it were made in, for example, birth outcomes, or maternal mortality, which is much uh, less visible and uh, less likely to attract attention than the person who needs uh, the, the $300,000 therapy. We don't do that well. So it's not that we want to give up on the importance of the individual, but that doesn't translate into effective resource allocation. As George Orwell famously said in Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And that's sort of where we, I think we find ourselves. So I will just close on the implications with what I view as the evolution of something that I heard when I first started in health policy. When I, when I first went into health policy, I'd go to a lot of conferences and everyone would put up uh, uh, on, the, on the screen, back then we used slide, uh, uh, transparencies, right? They had a triangle with access, cost, and quality. And the, the, the sentence was, access, cost, and quality. You can have two, but you can't have all three. That, I, I heard that, I can't tell you how many times I heard that. If we are gonna cover everyone, we're gonna have to either dramatically uh, uh, scale back what we pay, or more likely, we're gonna get lousy quality care. That was, that was a given. And then about 10 or 15 years ago, we started a different story. And the story was, we need everyone in in order to have costs under control. It's all the people who are uninsured who are going to the emergency room and they're getting episodic care and we're not giving them the primary care they need. And if we just had them in the system, then costs would be under control. Well, we don't have everyone in the system, but we have a lot closer and costs aren't under control. What I would argue is that the absence of agreement on values means we cannot adopt any rational approaches to having efficiency in the healthcare system. Without a core set of values, it's everyone on their own, it's rent seeking, it's, it's profit seeking, and it's getting what you can. And yes, there are millions of people who, are, who deliver care, who are part of the healthcare system, who don't every day go to work feeling that or thinking that. This is not an indictment of the people, but the system as a whole places those pressures. You can't succeed or, or thrive if you don't fit within the signals that your environment is sending you. And that's where we don't have agreement. And so we just don't have a basis on which to do anything to create a more efficient and rational system. Uh, that scares me because we're at, you know, rapidly approaching a fifth of GDP. We're crowding out spending in other places. If there are no limits in healthcare, it just means there are more limits everywhere else. I don't think the yield in terms of human happiness associated with those marginal dollars in healthcare comes close to the incremental improvement in human happiness and well-being that we could get from other places. But if we have no way to say no, I don't know how we move. But I'm an optimist. <laughs> so the last bit of my comments will be about the response to this. I've given you my hypothesis and the evidence for it. I've given you what I think are some of the implications. How do we respond? Oh, my screen's gone blank. <laughs> well, I'll try a few things out. I'm not very comfortable with them. One response, a crisis. We come together as a country in a crisis. We look out for our neighbors in a crisis. We what does it do? Why do we do that? Partly because we're generous people. But if I were to take this back to the values level, I would say it breaks down the deserving, undeserving barrier. In a crisis, everyone's deserving. You don't look at the person and say, did you try hard enough? Are you really looking for a job? Are you monitoring your glucose? We don't do those things. We say, everyone is suffering. How, how can I help? And that, that's one of the amazing things about being human, being American. 
So it is possible that some crisis, not that I would ask for one, or that I would even know what it is, could help us break down some of these barriers and we would come together and say, uh, we're facing flu pandemic. Uh, it doesn't seem out of the, out of the possibility. Um, that could, could be a glue that would hold us together. I'm not too optimistic, partly I don't want to wish for a crisis, and I think our coming together tends to be pretty ephemeral when we are in crisis. So we move on as quickly as possible and go back to deserving, undeserving. But I think crises can bring us together. My favorite response that I'm going to take on is the response of federalism. Since I've worked in state health policy, that's my thing. I often hear people say, uh, you're right. We don't have agreement as a country, but let the state solve the problem. The states can solve the problem. And, and, and one reason that that's appealing is that if you think about value coherence and value alignment, the larger a group you're talking to, the more likely you have a spread of values. And it's certainly not that there's a single set of values in Alabama or a single set of values in my state of Virginia, but probably the bounds are a little tighter. Certainly when I lived in Massachusetts, I felt a lot tighter range of values than I do when I travel around the country. So from a values perspective, you can see the appeal of relying on states. My challenge here, and it's really a practical challenge, is that the tools for addressing what ails us in healthcare are not really held at the state level. Um, there are tools, certainly insurance regulation is at the state level, licensure and certification is at the state level, Medicaid and CHIP programs are run at the state level, lots of policies made. But pharmaceutical pricing, those are international, they're, not, they're global institutions, they're not even national, and, and the whole Medicare program and how it shapes the delivery system, that's decided at the national level. Hospitals increasingly are parts of chains, uh, we have a new paper on, on pricing of, of, of devices. I hadn't realized uh, de medical devices are 6% of our healthcare spending. Those are uh, like pharmaceuticals, they're, they are uh, glo global uh, enterprises. Um, so the notion that, and large employers cross boundaries and they want universal or consistent rules for their employees, I, I just think it's unrealistic to think that one state at a time, we can solve what ails us in healthcare. Local is in some ways better than state when it comes to coherence of values, uh, but local governments have even fewer tools than states. Just ask any locality, they'll tell you that. And there is this problem of accountability as with the demise of media in this country. It's pretty scary sometimes what you read happens with no one knowing about it. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen at every level of government, but with less and less state and local press, I worry more about, more about accountability at that level. Um, another potential tool is a fiscal crisis. I don't mean a health crisis. I mean the fact that here we are with the economy by all the major measures doing as well as we could possibly ask it to be, but we're running trillion dollar deficits. We're not exactly saving for tougher days. And uh, maybe we hit a point where we say, the game's up. We've got to recalculate and recalibrate our relationships. My fear there is that a fiscal crisis, I think, is more likely to send us in the wrong direction than the right direction. Fiscal crises tend to focus on programs. We go back to Who's deserving and who's not, and who are we paying for and who's not? When I look at the healthcare system as a whole and I see inefficiency and I see misallocation, it's not the purview of Medicare or Medicaid, it's everywhere. And there is no stewardship of the private side of the healthcare system, even though that's where most of us are financed and most of us get our care. And so I, don't, I think a fiscal crisis tends to divide us more than unite us. That's my experience, it's my observation. So where's that optimist? <laughs> um, hard to find. 
the reason I'm optimistic is that when I look over longer spans of time, I am stunned at the changes and the progress. I am also keenly aware of the shortcomings. I think it's one of the great things about being an American is that we can take pride in where we've come and the principles on which we are built, but we can also look at ourselves critically and have aspirations for where we want to be. I grew up in Nashville, not so far from here, right in the post-desegregation era. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Nashville's a totally different place than it was when I grew up. I, I have three girls, 13, 12, and 10. They talk to me about uh, gender and LGBTQI, things that we wouldn't have ever had a conversation about when I was a kid. And they speak with it, about it openly and freely and unabashedly. And I'm in one of the best uh, school districts in the country. Um, my white kids are not the majority uh, race and ethnicity in their school. We have people from all over the world. And they don't notice. I don't have some theoretical dream of color blindness because it's not, I think we need to be color aware. That's a whole other story. We need to be aware of our biases. But when I look at my kids, I know they are growing up with a very different sense of what to expect from people and who they expect to be around and what people's talents and skills are. And things that were just in the air and the water when I was growing up, they're not in the air and the water where my kids are growing up. These are things that make me optimistic. And yet, could I have predicted any of these things? Could I have built the road? Could I have told you what the road is? I couldn't have. So the fact that I can't stand here and tell you we'll have a crisis or the states will solve it or something, the fact that I can't tell you that doesn't take away from my optimism. It just means that I have to have enough faith in the American uh, enterprise, the American experience to find a way to a better place. I actually think we do have a surprising number of shared values. Look at the debates that we are having right now. The question of whether health insurance should it be allowed to exclude people with pre-existing uh, health conditions. We are now at a place where everyone of both political parties says that, that, that health insurance should not exclude people for pre-existing conditions. Even people who have publicly taken the opposite position are now saying that they're for it. That's a shared value of, I, I'm not exactly going to call it equity, but it has something to do with solidarity. Look at the efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, unsuccessful largely surprising many people because of the implications of repealing the Medicaid expansion, even in states that didn't do so nationally. The notion that we were going to take away health insurance from all these people who finally we had given it to and had no way, no alternative to cover them. The sense of fairness and unfairness, even the political move to expand Medicaid in states where there's, so, there's the, the, the gap where if your income's low enough, you can be on Medicaid, and if it's high enough, you can be on the insurance exchange, but if you're in the middle, there's nothing for you. That sen those senses of fairness, they, they speak to people. I think there are shared values. At the moment, I think, despite the, the positive overall uh, fiscal situation and the economy seeming to be good, so many people live precariously that fear, I believe, overtakes the shared values. They worry about losing something. And many of them have been told that if, that, that if someone else gets something, it's coming from them. That if, if, if that person has health care, it's because you won't. And, we're gonna, and there are people who want to take away what you have to give it to them. That fear, I think, stands in the way of the values that actually are shared. I, I, I think it's hard for people to express their shared values because of the fear, fear. I don't think it means that the values are not shared. I don't mean to paper over our differences, but I think we can overstate them. Leadership, which often comes from the ground up, can pave the way for bringing out the best in us. And that's 
where I find my optimism is in a sense of the potential of leaders to show us that you don't have to be afraid, that there is value in addressing these issues together and that we do share more than uh, what separates us. So is it the end of US health policy? Sorry if you came here because I was gonna tell you that it is. It's not, there's always gonna be health policy. It's gonna bounce around. Don't exactly know where it's gonna land. It's not that we're at the end of US health policy. But I don't today think we can look at federal policy to achieve what we need, rational resource allocation, uh, access for people who need it, uh, availability based on need. These are not things that are gonna come from federal policy defining the American healthcare system. If we want better, better care, more affordable care, more accessible care, we, the people, are gonna have to demand it, and we're gonna have to demand it one person at a time. Thank you very much.